Hi, everyone. Welcome, welcome to the National Academy of Sciences. I'm J.D. Tulosic. I'm the Director of Cultural Programs here at the NAS. And I'm joined here with our collaborator, collaborator David Hassler, who is the Director of the Wick Poetry Center at Kent State University. So welcome. So for over 14 years now, we've hosted these, what we've called DAZERS, DC Art Science Evening Rendezvous, to encourage cross-disciplinary discussion and networking, and to share integrative and collaborative work, work that informs our systems of knowledge and benefits not only us as individuals, but as a society. And we are made stronger, as always, with our partnerships, and we are grateful for our long-standing partnership with Leonardo, the International Society of Art, Science, and Technology, and their network of over 50 similar salons of this around the world. Uh, we're also grateful to our collaborators with uh, the team of Issues in Science and Technology, which is a policy journal co-published between the National Academy of Sciences, uh, Engineering and Medicine, and Arizona State University. But tonight's special, in celebration of Poetry Month, we are delighted to collaborate once again with the wonderful people at Wick Poetry Center and to bring us uh, this wonderful evening of poetry, science, and society. And I'm going to turn this over to David so we can hear a little bit more about Wick, the Wick Center and the exhibit that uh, many of you have already seen here today. Thanks, David. Thank you, J.D. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here, and I want to thank our Kent State University College of Arts and Sciences for their ongoing support of our Poets for Science project. Uh, and we're thrilled with your uh, installing the Poets for Science exhibit in the two galleries outside, which we hope you all will have a chance to see. I want to give just a brief, uh, brief history of the Poets for Science uh, exhibit, which is partly the celebration tonight and in bringing our distinguished speakers. Uh, it began with a message from Jane Hirschfield, poet Jane Hirschfield. We were just talking literally six years ago and a few days, um, well, six years in a, in, a, in a month or so, and she called me and said, David, I have an idea. What about a Poets for Science event at the, at the March for Science on the National Mall, the original March for Science? Can you help me? And that's all I needed to hear. And I said, yes, we have a design firm. And we worked with, very quickly, designed seven-foot banners of 21 poems about science, portable banners, which we brought to the National Mall for the original March for Science, and organized a teach-in tent where people came into the tent, wrote poems, and wrote erasure blackout poems with text from speakers of that day. Um, and that exhibit kind of grew. And we began to travel it around the country. And we've recently realized that it resonates with people of all ages, um, all disciplines, and, and all backgrounds. We've just finished a collaboration with AGU, the American Geophysical Union, at their national at their meeting in Chicago in December, and created a, a poets for science community poem and video, and took it to the AWP conference, which is the Association of Writers and Writing Programs. Whether with writers or scientists, that level of enthusiasm and engagement with the exhibit has been the same, and it feels as if we're in a moment now in our society in which so many of us have a hunger to integrate rather than separate the worlds of science and spirit to make those leaping thoughts and connections across disciplines. So I believe this hunger, this calling, comes out of the great need that we all feel individually and collectively to bring our knowledge and creative thinking toward the multiple challenges that are facing our society today. Certainly, not only our climate crisis, which threatens our own human existence, but also a crisis of meaning and belonging that we're feeling in our lives and in society. So Poets for Science, which began as a humble pop-up exhibit on the National Mall six years ago, now feels more like a movement. And we have Jane Hirschfield to thank for that. And ultimately, it is an effort to amplify the urgency of this call, to encourage these conversations like we are having tonight, and as JD mentioned, are happening all over the world, and to inspire us to action. So welcome, you all. 
Um, I'd like now to just introduce our distinguished panelists uh, all at once. Their full bios in the, are in the program, and then we'll invite Actually, them up. Let me, let me, before you do that, David, let me ask just real quickly, who's been here to a Dazer before? Okay, so you're familiar with the way we do things. We're not gonna do them that way this time. <laughs> yeah. We're gonna, we're gonna experiment with something a little bit different. You know that we typically have a community share where everybody who wants to share what they're doing comes up at the very beginning. We're gonna do that at the end, okay? And the idea that we're doing this is always has been our intent so that people can introduce themselves and you know who to introduce yourself at the reception. Having it at the end, we wanna see if that helps our networking effort, because that's what Dazer is about. It's about collaboration, it's about integration, it's about meeting people who have the sort of similar uh, enthusiasm. So that's gonna be the end. The other little change is we're gonna have a little 10 minute intermission between when our, our distinguished panelists speak and when we uh, have our, our discussion. So just a little bit of a break uh, while we get mic'd, a uh, little stretch and, and that sort of thing. So um, just follow our lead, we'll get you through it. And thanks, we're so glad you're here. So who, who do we have speaking with us well, today, David? Well, to name, to name our four panelists, we have Jane Hirschfield, known as one of American poetry's central spokespersons for the biosphere. Um, and founder of Poets for Science, and the author of nine poetry books, including Ledger and The Beauty, long listed for the 2015 National Book Award. Given Sugar, Given Salt, finalist for the 2001 National Book Critics Circle Award, as well as met two non-class, two now classic collections of essays. Jane was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2019 as a former chancellor at the Academy of American Poets. Her long-standing interest in the dialogue between science and the arts has led her to serve as a poet in residence for both an experimental forest in Oregon and a neuroscience department at the University of California, San Francisco. Roel Hoffman has taught at Cornell since 1990, 1965 as the Frank H.T. Rhodes Professor of Human, Humane Letters Emeritus. His honors include the Nobel Prize in Chemistry, shared with Kaniki Fukui, and a National Academy of Sciences membership. He was the presenter of a TV course in chemistry titled The World of Chemistry, shown widely since 1990. As a writer, Hoffman has carved a out a land between science, poetry, and philosophy through many essays, five nonfiction books, three plays, and seven published collections of poetry. Poet, essayist, and naturalist Diane Ackerman is the author of over two dozen highly acclaimed works of poetry and nonfiction, including New York Times bestsellers, The Zookeeper's Wife, A Natural History of the Senses, and The Human Age. She has received the Stephen Hawking Medal for Communicating Science, the Penn Henry David Thoreau Award for Nature Writing, Orion Book Award, and the Levant Poetry Prize. In 2016, she was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and interesting to note, she's the only one who can claim that she has a molecule named after her, Diane Acaron. Alberto Rios is the author of numerous books of poetry and prose, including Not to Go Away is My Name, and The Smallest Muscle in the Human Body, which was nominated for the National Book Award, as well as Whispering to Fool the Wind, which won the Walt Whitman Award. Since 1994, Alberto has been Regents Professor of English at Arizona State University in Tempe. In 2013, he was named the inaugural State Poet Laureate of Arizona, and in 2017, he was appointed as the new director of the Virginia G. Piper Center for Creative Writing at Arizona State University. Those are the beautiful four individuals we have today to speak with us. Thank you. Jane, would you join us? Please welcome Jane to the stage. Jane, Jane Herschel. Well, it is remarkable and fabulous to have seen that exhibit here. Thank you all for coming. We were asked for this part of the program to speak a bit about our personal relationship to science and poetry, and I could think of no way to do that 
that would be clearer perhaps than simply reading you three poems, um, especially under limited time constraints. So I'm going to begin with the poem from which this project actually began. Um, some of you will likely remember that on uh, January 24th, 2017, the fifth day of the prior administration, the White House took down from its website every reference to climate change and instructed every scientist who worked for the federal government that they should not speak about their research in public without having prior permission. And because most of my close friends now are research scientists, this felt to me as personal as if it was, you know, we're now censoring the poets. And by the end of that day, I had written this poem, um, sent it to a few scientist friends. They sent it to other friends who sent it to other friends. By four days later, I was getting thank you notes from all over the country. And then when the March for Science was announced, um, that caused me to send them a little note on the volunteer slot saying, would you like to have poetry at the march? I have these seven ideas. And they took six of them. Um, so, on the fifth day. On the fifth day, the scientists who studied the rivers were forbidden to speak or to study the rivers. The scientists who studied the air were told not to speak of the air and the ones who worked for the farmers were silenced, and the ones who worked for the bees. Someone from deep in the badlands began posting facts. The facts were told not to speak and were taken away. The facts, surprised to be taken, were silent. Now it was only the rivers that spoke of the rivers, and only the wind that spoke of its bees while the unpausing factual buds of the fruit trees continued to move toward their fruit. The silence spoke loudly of silence, and the rivers kept speaking of rivers, of boulders and air. Bound to gravity, earless and tongueless, the untested rivers kept speaking. Bus drivers, shelf stalkers, code writers, machinists, accountants, lab techs, cellists kept speaking. They spoke the fifth day of silence. So the second poem was written in 2013 uh, when a New York Times uh, Tuesday Science Page article said that the protein responsible for how itch worked had been discovered. <laughs> and, you know, as soon as I read this, I was very excited. <laughs> I don't know. You cannot know what will lead to a poem, but as soon as I read that, I knew, ah, uh, there's something here. Um, the poem. The, the two things, probably everyone in this room knows this, but um, one of the things that's helpful to know for the poem is that the word protein comes from the Greek god Proteus, who changes shapes, which of course is how proteins do their work. And the other thing is the poem slides into the then rather recently made public research about the microbiome. And so it is about both itch and the microbiome. And primarily, I suppose, it is, as the series of poems that it's part of, they all begin with the word my. It's investigating, you know, what are we? What is a self? Where do we begin and end? My proteins. They have discovered, they say, the protein of itch, naturetic polypeptide B, and that it travels its own distinct pathway inside my spine as do pain, pleasure, and heat. A body, it seems, is a highway, a cloverleaf crossing, well-built, well-traversed, some of me going north, some going south. Ninety percent of my cells, they have discovered, are not my own person. They are other beings inside me, as 96% of my life is not my life. Yet I, they say, am they, 
my bacteria and yeasts, my father and mother, grandparents, lovers, my drivers talking on cell phones, my subways and bridges, my thieves, my police who chase myself night and day. My proteins, apparently also me, fold the shirts. I find in this crowded metropolis a quiet corner where I build of not me Lego blocks a bench, pigeons, a sandwich of rye bread, mustard, and cheese. It is me and is not the hunger that makes the sandwich good. It is not me then is the sandwich, a mystery neither of us can fold, unfold, or consume. And the last poem I will read you is a newer poem that will be in a book called The Asking coming out this fall. Um, it is a poem of resilience in difficult circumstances, and it also came from a New York Times Science Times article, uh, which was published July 29th, 2020, um, about how mosses survive in the desert. And, you know, to give you a little more than just poems and to talk a little about what we were asked to speak about, I turned to writing poems for what is difficult or impossible to take in or to understand, for the questions and fractures in my life for which there is no single or objective answer, but questions which still require response. And so a great many of my poems, like this one, are um, trying to feel and think my way into the crisis of climate that we are so well advanced into now. And, you know, the physicists and biologists and astronomers and neuroscientists are bringing to all of us and to each other acts of precise witness. But those acts cannot do their work in the world. Their witness cannot do its work in the world without equal acts of feeling, of understanding with the entire self. And so poems are the gates of feeling. They are the gates of pondering beauty's shiver, of the recalibration of gratitude and awe. And I truly believe that the reason that science and poetry must join hands is because we cannot understand anything fully without both. You know, a scientist only recognizes if they've made a discovery of significance because they feel thrilled. They know what they've done by an emotional response. And a poet only knows that a poem feels complete if it also feels useful, if it feels in some way grounded in the reality of our lives. Um, you know, we will only work to save what we love and what we love, we want to understand. Um, so, mosses. In the Mojave Desert, a, tr a translucent crystal offers bryophytes much needed respite from the heat of the sun. That was the New York Times. For hypolithic mosses, it seems, 4% of daylight is right. They live, the headline says, by sheltering under a parasol of translucent quartz. The crystal scatters the light's ultraviolet, dilutes its heat, traps the night's condensed moisture to moss-sized rain. I think of, those, of these mosses and consider. Perhaps we too are mosses, evolving to the parch of our self-made Mojaves, unable to bear the full brightness, the full seeing, to recognize fully the Amazon burning, the Arctic burning, the monarch's smoke-colored missing migration an experiment not meant to last. And yet, we found shelter within it. We pondered our lives and the lives of others, thirsted, slept. 
to the implausible, to the implausible green of existence, for better, for worse, we offered our 4% portion of praises. For better, for worse, our 4% portion of comprehension. Thank you. So uh, I'm a scientist and I'm a writer. Uh, within my field, chemistry, I do not write in an explicitly, well, I would say superficially, poetic style. First of all, I couldn't get it by the gatekeepers in my field. It would be a minus. And second, people would focus on the style rather than the substance. So I stay where I have been, and I've had a good run of it over the years. But actually, there is a poetic element in my chemistry, if I think about it. Uh, my métier is theoretical chemistry. Uh, I get quantum mechanical knowledge of how uh, electrons move in molecules, and I extract from that rationalizations, trends, and predictions of the shapes and reactivities of molecules. The poetic element comfortably ensconced in the cognitive framework of the chemistry, and that's going to be a problem in translating it into poetry, um, is in shaping concise, precise, portable, perhaps elegant uh, explanations. It is the drawing of unexpected connections uh, between one part of chemistry and another. For instance, that the electrons moving in the most important part of a typical organic grouping of a CH3 are similar in important ways to those moving in a very inorganic fragment of a cobalt which has three phosphines around it. Uh, surprise, economy of statement or intensity, structures of similarity and um, things like difference, those are the poetic elements. Okay. When I began to write poetry, I had the naive notion that, you, that I could, through the poetry, maybe talk about directly about the science that I did. I mean, if, if a lumberjack could do it, why couldn't I do it as a scientist? And, uh, but, uh, so I tried in various ways. I've actually put some of the, I'm going to read a poem, but I've put it uh, on here, the problem is that I didn't make it big enough. So you see, I, not, it's not only you have trouble with technology. Uh, this is an example of a poem, and it has to do with spectroscopy, uh, the stuff of analytical chemistry, of identifying molecules from the signals they give in response to light, and it has to do with the structure beliefs of the quiche maya uh, and if you want to go to the if you want to go to Dumberton Oaks you can see a little bit about about that maya spectra I'll say something about whether this works or not but it's pretty obvious in the, I begin with an epigraph in a Popol Vu the council book of the quiche maya Hinanpu and Spalanke, and I apologize for the pronunciations of the Maya names here, uh, are the com conquering and playful twin heroes. They are players of the Mesoamerican ball game in which a rubber ball is hit with a yoke um, 
uh, with and that uh, rides on the legs. They are challenged to a ball game which has lethal consequences um, by the 12 nasty lords of Shivalba, the death-dealing rulers of the underworld. Okay, here's the poem. The bright beam sent caroming off four mirrors of the optical bench into the monochromator penetrates invisible but intent like the mosquito off on his spying errand for Hunanpu and Zbalanka, sly heavenly twins of the Popol Vuh. For that light means to sting too, inciting the electron cloud's harmony with a ball, a wave to a state-to-state -state dance while the mosquito flies in dark rain. The sun is yet unformed down the black road to Shibalba, bites the false wooden idols, registering their blank of an answer onto the first who God flesh bit, cries out, jumps, and the next dark lord calls, one death, what is it, one death, which in turn the mosquito records from the lightest drawn energy, like blood leaving on a plotter or a limp signature of H bonded to C, sampling down the row of heart reeking gods, pus master, seven deaths, bone scepter, bloody claws, the rose stung, name each other as do carbonio methyl aldehyde amine prodded by the beam, caught in the end like the ball in Spalanquas yoke. The losers are sacrificed, the twins win, and life is made clear by signals from within. Okay. Uh, I tried too much. I tried to, to mag magisteria, which uh, just take a certain cognitive framework of the, of the mythology and the analytical chemistry. But I knew I was trying. It doesn't work, okay? So this is a poem that doesn't work. I'll t give you some that I think do. Uh, but this one doesn't. Uh, and yet, a few things about this. First of all, at least you get the point that not only is the initial situation with the mosquitoes and the 12 laws of Shibalba a inherently comic as well as tragic one, but also I don't take myself too seriously. That you get at least from the couplet at the end, if nothing else. But the, um, so that's, that's good. Poetry should sometimes not take itself too seriously. Um, the other thing though is I'm hoping, I'm hoping that if you get used to the weird names of the lords of Sibalba that you won't be scared by carbonomethylamine, okay? <laughs> Equally weird words, but that's all they are, are names of, they're actually more. And, uh, but uh, at least we're, we're uh, that's what I was hoping for, but it, it didn't work too, too well. After that, I relaxed and I let the science come uh, as it does, and, uh, and let me give you an example of that from a, a poem that's set in a place that Jane knows very well in the uh, hills that roll down from just over Stanford down to the sea near, uh, near Santa Cruz. Lava. I think the chaparral grows at night, starkly violating the laws of photosynthesis. For in the moon's stringent light, there are only vital signs. This splurge of wild animal fur, glistening green-black off the pale hill's grass ground, what life owls haunt the refulgent, oily blackness of a bee swarm on the way to a new hive. The chaparral is moving. The chaparral may be moving, unseen, hollow to hollow every night. Okay, so <laughs> what science is in there? <laughs> Start. It, the science is that I stopped thinking about whether it, I, I should write about uh, for, uh, the words, the, 
violating the laws of photosynthesis just came naturally to me. And that's where I, a situation that I had to get to in order to allow then to construct more creatively the interaction of science and poetry. That's all that I want to show you with that poem. I'll read you a third poem. But um, science eventually entered my poetry. Uh, there was the language of science, a natural language under stress, uh, therefore inherently poetic. Why do I say under stress? Because science is continuously forced to express new things with the same old words with the help of a few equations and moreover that scientists don't think that the words matter but of course they do and so they are uh, influenced by the meanings and resonances of the words uh, and then we try to define in those words things which are in some way um, that refuse to be unambiguous, refuse to be uh, defined. I spot found poems in this language of science. I also began to see metaphor floating there for free in the science. If I would get, if I would get sleepy in a seminar, it was given to me to hear many boring seminars. And when I get sleepy, I'd go to sleep and I'd wake up uh, and the guy was still talking, and then I'd begin to listen to the language that he's using, and that language was the source of a number of poems, a found, found language. But I began to do other things, and I want to read you one of these, which I think works a bit better than the initial one that I read to you, and that'll be the last one that I read. Rewrit. You'll see in a moment what's being rewritten here, it's pretty obvious. When God made the sun, he lay back on his white sand beach and reaching out with both pale hands into his space, he shaped there a sphere of hydrogen, God did. Set it alight with his nuclear fire, he felt, God felt, its warmth on his soft hand, and it was good. It was his son. When God set about next to make the moon, he put his feet on the ice cap of Mars and reached out again, seizing a piece of an old sun, and God threw it like a snowball at his earth. The earth racked, rocked, and so the moon, God's moon, came to be. He felt its reflecting light, and it was good, his moon. When the time came for God to people this blue earth, he stood knee deep in paddy and sea, and dear God, he didn't make people in his image, but just reached out his now sunburnt hands to plant a mitochondrion, here a squid's eye, a seed of rice, hazard he gave them, rules, God's time, and soon enough the creatures came, spoke. It was good, the word between God and his people. Thank you. Please welcome to the stage, Diane Packer. Thank you very much. Ever since I was a child, I wanted to be a nature poet. It's just that what I meant by nature was the full sum of creation. Everything from quarks and exoplanets to tardigrades, a personal favorite, and humans. Alas, this was thought bizarre when I entered Cornell as a graduate student and began writing a book-length suite of scientifically accurate poems about the planets. One day, a literary critic drew me aside and said with great concern, what's a nice girl like you doing writing about amino acids? 
I tried to explain <laughs> that I just didn't find the world, the universe, knowable from only one perspective. And that the whole big, buzzing, blooming spectacle of life fascinated me. And that I took the word universe literally as one verse. But I, I didn't persuade him. Luckily, I had a poet, A.R. Ammons, and an astronomer, Carl Sagan, on my MFA and PhD committees. And yeah, that was really great. <laughs> they were able to run interference for me. And so I was able to pursue degrees in the humanities while poaching in the sciences the whole time. I write books of poetry and poetic prose, and I feel so grateful to have a calling that allows me to create my own astonishment. Writing is my form of celebration and secular prayer, and it's also the way that I inquire about the world. And that may inspire me to write about the mystery of the brain or the Anthropocene or an endangered animal or why hummingbirds tend to die in their sleep um, or what I'm working on now, uh, how our sensory lives have changed. But whether it's in poetry or prose, they're all part of the same lifelong quest to somehow make the world sayable and to better understand what it was like to have once been alive on this particular planet, how it felt in our senses, passions, contemplations. What did it taste like, smell like, hurt like, yearn like, thrill like? Everything I've written in poetry or prose has been an attempt to find answers to those questions. Deep down, I know this is really quite foolish, it would have to take from birth to death and include all of consciousness, and even then, I wouldn't be able to do it. And I suppose I should find that overwhelming, but I don't picture it in that way. I just think of it as a simple mystery trip. The world revealing itself, human nature revealing itself, is so seductive and startling, and that's always been fascinating enough to send words down my spine. Uh, I'm going to start with a poem called Diffraction. When Carl tells me it's Rayleigh scattering that makes blue light canting off molecular grit go through the slowly through the aerial gel and outlying mountains look swarthy or wheat blaze tawny rose in the eight o'clock sun, how I envy his light touch on Earth's magnetic bridle. Knee deep in the cosmic overwhelm, I'm stricken by the ricochet wonder of it all, the plain everythingness of everything, in cahoots with the everythingness of everything else. The second pair of pants in my genetic suit held no whys and wherefores, no clement unity, no federation of water flea and Magellanic cloud. Mathematics is a language I don't speak. I can't unveil the sun's ricey complexion really fathom Vila X ticking like a clock, track comets on the run through hyperbola, parabola, or ellipse. I'm bone deaf to cloud chamber music. When Carl tells me it's really scattering that azures the sky or unpuzzles rainbow grinding weather, I envy his firm grip on a world where I tend to think not like a thinker thinks, but as light engrossed in every object a doting consciousness among alien forms. I only know one rural twilight when wheat blazed like ambergris and a chicory sun haggled with a black sky, for a moment all the blues of the world scattered. My rib cage sprang open like calipers and in their widening compass, nothing lacked. I lived uh, next to a high energy physicist. I mean, that's what she studied, but she also was very energetic. And um, Persis Drell, in case you, you know her. And we used to swim laps every morning. And so I, I wrote a poem about that called By Adams Moved. 
On cool summer mornings, as the pool steams, Persis and I slip our curves into its and crawl towards an invisible shore, churning half an hour into half a mile of blue, arc over arc. Then we arrive glad as immigrants at travel's end, a place we've come to know but can't describe except with the soft machinery of our limbs. My mind's abacus always floats away, so Persis counts laps, glad to oblige, since by day she hurls the minuscule at speed, ramming electrons until their guts spill free, then using numbers to read the entrails at the particle accelerator down the road. When fatigue tugs, we like to rest halfway and share the odd busy news of our lives. It's still a little early for deeper truths, but swimmable mornings will pivot right into fall, despite the chill until leaves fly. What better place for poet and physicist to meet than astride waves, dreamily yawning, somewhere afloat between earth and sky on the bright geometry of a summer morning? There was a wonderful uh, painter and also entomologist uh, named Maria Sibylla Marion, who lived in the uh, 17th century. And um, I've been writing uh, quite a bit about her. And here's just a little poem about her, Maria Sibylla Marion, 1670. There was a way of beholding nature that was like a form of prayer. When she painted a caterpillar, she limbed the whole bracing saga of its life, from birth, instars, and metamorphosis, to the plants it gorged on and the predators who stalked it. Balancing the mingled dramas on one toothy page of vellum, she by the by bore witness to feats of nature outlandishly ordinary, such as maggots hatching naturally from eggs like so many living things, not from dead flesh or dust, in spontaneous generation. She chose to reveal the smallest, most despised creatures on earth as divine works of nature and tag them not in Latin, the scholar's language, but colloquially, colorfully in street talk, inviting people to put aside the mask of habit, the hostile omens of superstition, and any disgust that they might harbor about vermin and peer in wonder at the visible but unseen all around them, dining, sparring, molting, mating, in a mad frenzy of war and survival, worlds unseen because unnoticed, not because as piety taught, God hid them from view. Here is a caterpillar's eye, her paintings say. Look how cleverly it's designed. Here is a spider's toe with tiny hairs. Can you imagine how they tread? Here is time elapsing inside a chrysalis where caterpillar becomes butterfly, shape shifting with infinite gradualness from one unlikely form to another, its behavior and purpose radically changed. Come closer, I will show you. Um, and finally, I'm going to read a poem about the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, SETI. I was in the Journalist in Space project, which of course was canceled uh, after the Challenger tragedy, but oh my goodness, I wanted to go so much and be able to look down and see everything I've ever known, everyone I've ever loved in one place there on Earth. And also, when I was a little girl, my favorite fantasy was that I belonged to a group of itinerant extraterrestrial poets. <laughs> yeah, so my parents found me a little strange because of this. But anyway, um, our job was to travel from one solar system to another, and we would get born into the life of whatever the intelligent life form was on that planet and create art in that way and then the art would all be accumulated into a library that they had. 
Um, and I, this time around, I just happened to be on this little blue planet, you know, in the backwaters of space. But I still want to go. We are listening. As our metal eyes wake to absolute night, where whispers fly from the beginning of time, we cup our ears to the heavens. We are listening. On the volcanic rim of Flagstaff and in the fields beyond Boston, in a great array that blooms like coral from the desert floor, on high wire webs patrolled by computer spiders in Puerto Rico, we are listening for a sound beyond us, beyond sound, searching for a lighthouse in the breakwaters of our uncertainty, an electronic murmur, a bright, fragile I am. Small as tree frogs staking out one end of an endless swamp, we are listening through the longest night we can imagine, which dawns between the life and times of stars. Our voice trembles with its own electric, we who mood like iguanas, we who breathe sleep for a third of our lives, we who heat food to the steaminess of fresh prey, then feast with such good manners that it grows cold. In mine gardens and on real verandas, we are listening, wrapped among the Persian lilacs and the crickets, while radio telescopes roll their heads as if in anguish. With our scurrying minds and our lidless will and our lank floppy bodies and our galloping yens and our deep cosmic loneliness and our starbird hearts where love careens, we are listening, the small bipeds with the giant dreams. Welcome everybody, bienvenidos todos, and also uh, bienvenuto, welcome, bienvenu, bienvindo, que ahora, aloha, shalom, salam, <laughs> hi. You know, so many ways to say so simple a thing, you'd think that as human beings we could have gotten this straight by now, but we're all different. We're all different, and I take that as a good thing. Science sometimes struggles with that. I want to say that science may be our best way of understanding the world, but it may not be our best way of living in it. Science and poetry are not at odds. We've heard that earlier tonight. It's not either or, it's also and. A dictionary, for example, is efficient, but a poem is effective. In a dictionary, you have all the words in the world. Very efficient. But a poem, only a few words. They're effective. That distinction is huge. But you don't get to choose some words without having them all. We need both. It also makes us consider that science is one thing. And what science does is another. Who are we who are doing this with the science that presents itself to us? Who are we? Cultures, let me say, play an important role in this. And uh, I'm going to give you a very simple demonstration. If I hold this pen up, and if I speak only one language, for example, I'm going to call it a pen and be done with it. I'm going to go on to something next, pencil or whatever comes. But pen, what else do I need to say about it? If you speak more than one language, however, you have to stop for a moment. A pen is also a pluma. What audience am I talking to? Who's going to understand what? So suddenly, I have to stop. And if this pluma is also a plume, has three names, Maybe it also has four. Maybe it also has ten. And suddenly this thing is wild in my hand. Wild. 
That's what science does. It looks at a thing till it becomes wild, important. It is the moment. I'm going to start by, by reading something about how culture affects science, how science affects cultures. And this comes from a, uh, a line my grandmother said to me one day. I was sitting with her, uh, and she said, uh, Sabes, hijo, she said, El peso me quiere. Weight loves me. <laughs> this is called Her Secret Love, whispered late in her years. Gravity wants me. <laughs> Gravity can't get enough of me. Every time I try to leave, it finds a way to make me come back. It shows up wherever I go. It's always been this way. It keeps trying to wrestle me to the ground, sometimes catching me by surprise at the ankle. It makes me laugh, and sometimes I give in. This thing that wants me, this magnet to my body, this amorous creature, it is a beast. But I would miss it if it were not there. I pretend otherwise. But it has turned me. I am the one now being drawn to its arms. Not simply it to me. I have heard it speak my name at last. I have opened the front door to it. When I was young, headstrong, and full of stars, I ran from it, not ready for any embrace more than the necklace those stars made for me. But gravity, not the stars, caught my tears. It has brought my hair down and made my summer dresses fall from me. Each time I was with child, it whispered my name in the night. As I grew a little heavier through the years, it only asked for me all the more. I never told how I have felt it with me in every step I've taken, longest companion, unswerving. It has never left my side, though all else is gone. Gravity wants me, I used to think. But I'm, I'm the one. I am the suitor I thought it was. I say very nice things to it now. I am desperate these days. Desperate and ready to lie down with it. Science also helps us to humanize ourselves, to see inside ourselves, but we also need to recognize it helps, if we are open to this, it helps to animalize us. And science in this relation uh, can sometimes be quite stark. Let me read this poem. Um, there were, we've had a lot of, I, I grew up in the desert, I live in the desert, and uh, we have a lot of fires. This is called Rabbits and Fire. Everything's been said but one last thing about the desert, and it's awful. During brush fires in the Sonoran Desert, brush fires which happened in the, you know, the brush fires which happened before the monsoon and in the great deep, wide, and smothering heat of the hottest months, the longest months, the hypnotic, immeasurable lulls of August and July. During these summer fires, jackrabbits, jackrabbits and everything else that lives in the rolling hills of the desert, but jackrabbits especially, jackrabbits can get caught in the flames. No matter how fast and big and strong and sleek they are, and when they're caught, 
cornered in and against the thick trunks and thin spines of the cactus, when they can't back up anymore, when they can't move, the flame, it touches them, and their fur catches fire. Of course they run away from the flame, finding movement even when there is none to be found, jumping big and high over the wave of fire or backing even harder through the impenetrable tangle of hardened saguaro and prickly pear and choya and barrel, but whichever way they find what happens is what happens. They catch on fire and then bring the fire with them when they run. They don't know they're on fire at first, running so fast as to make the fire shoot like rocket engines and smoke behind them. But then the rabbits tire, and the fire catches up with them, stuck onto them like the needles of the cactus, which at first they think must be what they feel on their skins. They felt this before, every rabbit. But this time, the feeling keeps on. And of course, they ignite the brush and dried weeds all over again, making more fire all around them. I'm sorry for the rabbits. And I'm sorry for us to know this. I have one more poem. Um, it's in a number of parts. It's for my father, and I, it, it has helped me. My, my father passed away some years ago, and I had in my head that science was going to save him. And he was such a, a spirit, such a, uh, an optimist, uh, that we had a working partner in science. And in its way, it did. This poem is called some extensions on the sovereignty of science. One, when the thought came to him, it was so simple, he shook his head. People are always looking for kidneys when kidneys go bad. But why wait? Why not look when you're healthy? If two good kidneys do the trick, wouldn't three do the job even better? Three kidneys! Maybe two livers, you know, and two hearts, of course. Instead of repairing damage, why not think ahead? Why not soup up the car? Why not be a touring eight-cylinder classic or one of those old 16-cylinder, half-mile-long Duesenbergs? Two. The hardest work of the last quarter of the 20th century is to find an edge in the middle. When something explodes, for example, nobody is confused about what to do. You look toward it. Loud is a magnet. But the laws of magnetism are more complex. One might just as well try this. When something explodes, Turn exactly opposite and see what there is to see. The loud will take care of itself and everyone will be able to say what happened in that direction. But who is looking the other way? Nature, that magician and author of loud sounds, zookeeper and cook, electrician and provocateur, Maybe these events are nature's sleight of hand. And the real thing that's happening is in the other hand, or behind, or above, or below, or inside us. Three. On a recent trip to Bloomington, Indiana, I was being driven there from Indianapolis. Have you ever worked Indianapolis into a poem? (laughs) I was being driven there from Indianapolis, and my friend along the way pointed out some hills, 
saying that these hills were made as a result of the farthest reach of the Ice Age glacier. I had been waiting for this moment ever since fifth grade. <laughs> I could hardly contain myself, though I'm sure I just said, uh-huh, in the conversation. I took a small and delicious breath. So, I said slowly, that's the terminal moraine, huh? <laughs> there, I'd said it. The phrase I'd saved up since the moment I found it in that fifth grade reader. Terminal moraine. I had never said it out loud. What's a little scary, of course, is that I was more excited about remembering than I was about the hills themselves. But if it was scary, it was sweet in the mouth, too. In the larger picture, one way or another, the Ice Age glacier was still a force to be reckoned with. Four. The reason you can't lose weight later on in life is simple enough. It's because of how so many people you know have died and that you carry a little of each of them with you. Five, the last. The smallest muscle in the human body is in the ear. It's also the only muscle that does not have blood vessels. It has fluid instead. The reason for this is clear. The ear is so sensitive that the body, if it heard its own pulse, would be devastated by the amplification of its own sound. In this knowledge, I sense a great metaphor, but I do not want to be hasty in trying to capture or describe it. Words are our weakest hold on the world. Thank you. Okay, so we're running just a little bit behind schedule, so let's do an eight-minute <laughs> intermission, if that's okay. Just take a moment to stretch, go to the restroom. I'm going to invite our panelists to come up uh, and our AV team to come help you uh, get microphoned as we, uh, as we go on. So th one more uh, round of applause for our panelists, please. Welcome back. David, would yes. you introduce us to uh, the second half of our program? So in our second half, we're very honored to have the chair of the NEA moderate a discussion with our distinguished panelists. Uh, Dr. Maria Rosario Jackson has focused her work on understanding and elevating arts, culture, and design as critical elements of healthy communities. Her work blends social science and arts and humanities-based approaches to comprehensive community revitalization, systems change, the dynamics of race and ethnicity, and the role of arts and culture in communities. After confirmation by the US Senate in December 2021, Dr. Jackson became the 13th chair of the National Endowment for the Arts in January 2020, 2022. With this historic appointment, Dr. Jackson is the first African-American and Mexican-American woman to serve as chair of the NEA. Thank you, Dr. Jackson, for joining us this evening. Thank you, David, for that introduction and welcome. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. It's a pleasure to be with you all today. I want to say thank you to the cultural programs of the National Academy of Sciences and Leonardo, the International Society for the Arts, Sciences, and Technology. Thank you for your inspiring leadership in producing this event and for your invitation uh, for me to join you. It's an honor to be here as part of our celebration of National Poetry Month and to moderate this conversation. And to everyone in attendance, thank you for being here tonight. 
I've been in my position a little over a year now, and a significant part of that time has involved traveling around the country to engage with people working in the arts and culture sector and intersecting sectors as well, community development, transportation, health, and others, including different branches of science. Through the experiences of those that I've had the honor to speak with, I've gained some sense of what people are facing on the ground, both challenges and opportunities. Some with whom I've had the chance to talk with tell me about real hardships, challenges that were accelerated or catalyzed by the pandemic, situations that have caused us to question our assumptions about fundamental concepts like audience participation, what it means to be healthy or well, and what success looks like. Some people are seizing the moment to think anew about core practices or affirm ways in which they've been working for many years. I think the last three years have taught us that we don't have to snap back to what was before the pandemic. We've had the uh, opportunity or the necessity to question our orthodoxies. And hopefully that's also led us to be able to be more discerning, to identify what's essential, foundational, not negotiable. One thing that has been affirmed for me is that the arts are essential perhaps now more than ever. The arts help us make sense of the world, offer us different ways of thinking, feeling, and being. They're a source of inspiration and innovation. They're critically important to our resilience and our evolution. And most importantly, the arts help us protect and advance our humanity. As I've traveled around the country, I've spoken about an idea that I've been advancing, and it focuses on the importance of people having the opportunity to live artful lives or art-filled lives. It's an inclusive concept. It contains a wide range of experiences, including deeply meaningful, active practices and expressions in our diverse everyday lives, making, doing, teaching, learning, as well as the production, presentation, and, and the experience or consumption of professional work. That whole spectrum is so valuable. In addition to the concept of artful lives, I've also been talking about how unleashing the full power of the arts requires it to not exist only in isolation. It requires, requires us to animate the work at the intersection of arts and education, climate, and more, including very important work at the intersection of health and well being, as well as science in general. This work at the intersections involves all artistic disciplines, including the literary arts. The NEA recognizes that the literary arts inspire and enrich our lives. They remind us that there is beauty and joy in language, that others have insights worth paying attention to, that in our struggles, we're not alone. And by helping writers and translators create new work and connect with the public, the NEA celebrates the literary arts as an essential reflection of our nation's rich diversity of voices. One of the arts endowments initiatives in partnership with the Poetry Foundation since 2005 is Poetry Out Loud. It's a free national arts education program that encourages high school students to engage with poetry through a dynamic recitation competition. The Poetry Out Loud National Finals is scheduled for May 10th here in Washington, DC, and I encourage you to seek it out. It's worth seeing. The state champions are inspiring on stage and the poems they recite, they're always powerful and deeply moving. In addition to Poetry Out Loud, the NEA Literature Fellowship Program supports prose and poetry by offering grants to creative writers to carve out time for writing, research, travel, and overall career advancement. Several of our poetry fellows this year have told us that they have a background or interest in the sciences and will be using their fellowship to explore and write about aspects of science, most notably climate change. For example, Bernard Ferguson is writing about Hurricane Dorian in the Caribbean in 2019. Imani Jackson is writing about tidal rivers and coasts as they relate to black history and culture. 
Ann McDonald teaches creative writing and climate justice at the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Rebecca Pelkey, an enrolled member of the Brothertown Indian Nation in Wisconsin, began writing poems later in life after a full career as a zookeeper and a wildlife dietitian. They're all currently NEA Poetry Fellows this year. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to engage in discussion with our panelists tonight. All four panelists are accomplished writers, poets, and trailblazers. Roald Hoffman's work as a chemist and writer brings to life the concept of art at the intersection of science. He's published books, plays, and poetry on the vital connections between arts and science. Our remaining panelists, all NEA Creative Writing Fellows, and we're so proud of that, Jane Hirschfield, Alberto Rios, Diane Ackerman, thank you for your innovation, your leadership, and your creativity in the world of poetry and literature, and thank you for how your work impacts so many facets of our world. I've been very much looking forward to this conversation. And with that, we'll start our conversation. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes, okay. It is so wonderful to be up here with you all. And thank you for sharing your thoughts and your poetry earlier this evening. There are so many things that got my attention as I was listening to you, and I just want to share back a few things that, that, um, that I jotted down. Because in my own work, I, I am often calling the question, what is the role of the work at the intersection of arts and other fields? And I heard, Jane, I heard you say that it has to do with understanding with the entirety of self. Roald, I heard you talk about drawing on unexpected connections. Diane, I heard you say, I didn't find the whole world knowable from one perspective. And Alberto, I was intrigued by the idea that science helps us helps to animalize us. Um, all of those are perhaps the beginning of a way of uh, talking about what is the role of your work today and now uh, in a context that is complicated and fractured and at the same time full of opportunity. So I just want to open a space for you to, to share with us, either to riff from what I sh wrote down or to offer something altogether new uh, as I ask the question, how do you see the role of your work today? I'm happy to start with an older story. I was doing some work in Arizona, in Eloy, very tough, a farm worker community. And I remember after a week of work, um, I was working in a classroom in which uh, the students were playing poker in the back. And there were about four attentive students. And I'm sorry to say that there were the uh, Mexican-American students on one side, the Chicano students, African-American students on one side. Everybody was playing poker of some sort in the back and throwing spit wads and whatever. And there was a, a, a teacher who said, are you here for the week? And I said, yeah. She says, I'll be in the teacher's lounge. <laughs> it's illegal in Arizona. You can't do that. But she went. So I was working with this. And, and as we got toward the end of the, uh, the week, I will never forget and this has given me a lot of purpose. A uh, young man comes walking up, and he's, he's doing his cholo walk already. You know, he's, uh, he's, he's coming up, and he's, he's ostensibly got a pencil, and he's going to sharpen his pencil in the front. Man, I, I, I know what that, I went to a hot, tough high school, too. You go to the front, you sharpen your pencil so you can look up dresses. <laughs> so I thought, you know, all right, OK. He comes up sharpens his pencil, turns around, he comes up to me and he says, so, because uh, we had read some poems, the, the four attentive students in the front had read some poems, and he said, you really like this poetry shit? <laughs> and I said, I do. It's what I do. He said, orale. And he said, so, and then he asked me a question that 
I am so glad it was me. I don't know who else would have gotten this. But he said to me, so, how many fights you had? <laughs> what he was asking me is, how do I get from where I am to where you are? And his only measure was fighting. And so I said to him, how many fights have I had? I said, only one. He said, it's lasted my whole life, just like you. And we left it at that. And <laughs> I, I think he remembers that conversation. I remember it all these years later. And I think that's one part of what I do is I need to speak to him. <laughs> I think that uh, if I can say something, I think what I what I serve is as a way for students. So I am a university professor. I can't escape it, but I I have taught thousands because I have taught half, half, when I was teaching, I taught introductory chemistry. Um, but I somehow allow students and faculty to play out some tensions that they have about having to make professional decisions while they have passions which are often of a spiritual nature, of one type or another. And I don't mean religious, but I mean playing music or, or playing video games even can be spiritual. But anyway, they have, they have certain passions and their parents are after them and society is after them to, to choose a profession. And somehow they have learned that I also do something else. So they come and talk to me, and I can tell them that it's possible to both do something professionally and to not give up your passions. And just that that possibility is something that no one has said to them. And I, I feel good about that. So I will say that, you know, I have always felt that the role of poetry is a bit as Diane describes it, you know, so, so multiple and so much about multiplicity that it's very hard to describe it in one dimension and leave out another. So perhaps because a great deal of our direction tonight is talking about uh, poetry as engaged, engaged with the great issues of our time, serving the great issues of our time. Um, I want to also add that I think it's very important that in this era of crisis upon crisis, that we not forget that poems also serve the inner life, the spiritual life, the private life, the individual life, that interiority is an indispensable part of what it is that poems bring to the larger discussion. Um, I also have long felt that all art, you know, what is the role of art? Part of it is the simple expression of exuberant abundance of the <clears throat> extravagant, opulent world. You know, art recognizes that and we take it into our body and we put it out, whether that is in um, painting or, or designs, you know, put onto a tattoo or, or songs or dance or words. Um, that's one role. Another role of art in the largest sense is to bring people together. And so poetry, part of its roots is lullabies, love songs work songs, songs of mourning, all events in which people need to come together to honor something important, some change of state. So the poem read at a wedding or a funeral is honoring the change of state. 
but contemporary art, very often the role of contemporary art is to look at what isn't going to be seen without the instrument of observation that the arts are. And so poems often look at exactly what is being neglected and speak towards that early, before other people are perhaps looking in that direction. And then from these scouting art forms of a new form of painting, a new way of speaking, a new subject matter coming into drama or song or poem, the culture shifts. But you can't divide the inner need from the public need. I don't think. I mean, for me, every poem begins with a personal perplexity or the old romantic description of poetry as, as uh, feeling so powerful that you must make art uh, <coughs> or, you, or you couldn't go on. And that feeling can be of any kind. And often for me in recent years, it has been the unbearableness of what we are witnessing now the unbearableness of both the collapse of the biological world in so many places and of our social compact in so many ways, our sense of being in it together. And so my poems moved to that. And you know, all you can do is offer them. Poetry is a very small art form with a relatively small audience. And yet a few poems step forward when they're needed. So I've always remembered when 9-11 happened, two poems came forward, one by the Polish poet Adam Zagajewski, recently written, and the other one by W.H. Auden, written at the beginning of the Second World War. And people turned to those poems because they held things that were unbearable and impossible to hold, and yet passing those poems hand to hand, something important was being re-knitted in the torn heart. I agree. Um, I, I see my role uh, as a poet of um, throwing buckets of light into the dark corners of existence that people miss sometimes. And it's, it's so easy to miss things that are hidden in, in plain sight, and it's even harder if they're invisible. And we have a lot of things that are invisible these days pressing on us in many different ways. And most of what I do, most of my job, I think is just to pay attention. And maybe that's most of all of our jobs, really. I'm reminded of um, In Cold Blood, when it came out, uh, remember, it was about two murderers, and there was a forensic psychologist afterwards who said that neither one of these men would have been able to kill, but together they created a third person who was a murderer. And in a benign way, I think that's what poetry does also. You know, think about how metaphors work, bringing together seemingly unrelated things to create something that we don't have language for because language is human made, but most of what happens to us falls between the seams. And we very much need um, poetry in order to cover some of those areas, especially um, as you were saying, in a, a time when we're living in a mutilated world. What do you do? when you're in a mutilated world. Well, I'm reminded that in World War II, um, in the Warsaw Ghetto, the rabbi there didn't um, talk about what was going on outside of the ghetto. He had his congregation meditate on the beauty of nature. He had them transcend by finding things that were larger than they were, that were going to continue after them, that were there so long before them. And it's very, um, 
it's very healing, I think, these days to help people see the everyday miracles that they are surrounded by. And very often, they don't know what they mean. They don't know the science that's involved with them. And once they do, it enriches it so profoundly because it gives them another set of lenses to put on it. And suddenly, you can look at something from a, a, a different a couple of different ways in a compound way. So the intersection of science and art, I think very important. Uh, for example, you were talking about um, the microbiome and so on. I talk um, quite a bit about, uh, when, usually when I'm out talking with uh, people, about um, how we have to stop thinking of ourselves as individuals. There, are, there is no I. Everyone is a we, and we are mainly microbial. You know, we are more uh, bacteria and other things than we are human, actually. And we're constantly interacting with the rest of nature and everyone that we meet, whom we inhale in various ways. They become part of our DNA. And if we can really absorb this scientifically and poetically, I think it will give us less of us, us against them attitude about nature and about other people and, and so on. And so that seems like an important job too. Yeah. In, in talking about uh, shedding light on what is difficult to see or unseen or paying attention intentionally, or even knitting together. Um, you also talked about the possibility of seeing possibilities through poetry. And Jane, I heard you also say that it's a small art, <laughs> that it is uh, one with a small audience, but it seems so powerful and necessary. So as you think about how it might not be a small art, what comes to mind? Small art with a big heart, <laughs> you know, or <clears throat> big, big repercussions, yeah. But it's because it is so powerful, and whether it's people writing or people hearing or reading it, engagement with it now seems so important. How, how do we get more people involved in poetry? I can speak to the, that just previously. Uh, something uh, I try to, when, in representing the humanities generally, I try to uh, expound a very simple thing. Uh, say it, and I will understand it. Say it well, and I will feel it. So where, where does that small art reside? Well, why do we go to the movies? Why do we go to concerts? We feel something, but we can't exactly go out and articulate that. And if we do, it's going to be different for everybody because we have, we have personally felt it. And there's something huge in that. And uh, art affects us in a, in a way that I, I think we simply fail to find the language to, to do. I'm sorry, you were asking another question, though. <laughs> no, but thank you for that. But because it does that, you know, I often... Um, bring up the reality that there's some science behind what it takes for one to be available to paradigm shift, right? And it, it is mm -hmm. that feeling. Yeah. It's the it, intellectual, emotional, and physical engagement. When I talk about public art, it's, it's this magical science. It's not magic at all. It's very human. Uh, public, the job of public art is to move us from where we're standing to what we're feeling, to move us from where we're standing. So you haven't moved at all, but you've moved tremendously. And, and that's that artful platform that, we're, that we stand on. You know? How do we get more of that? I think we shouldn't get too enamored of the idea that all art serves the good. Uh, I think <clears throat> let's, whether poetry or, na or narrative storytelling, we all think storytelling is good, but what is the common uh, falling into delusional narratives of conspiracy theories, but 
someone telling a damn good story that somebody else believes. Are you going to say those people are stupid who believe it? They're people still, and that story reaches them somehow. In the same way, advertising, which can be a force for the good, is the place where some of the, the resources of our society have marshaled the best art, poet, visual arts, poetry, and storytelling in the service of no particular good. And how do we, how will we deal with that? Uh, that um, it, I, I think it, the human beings behind it matter, their motives matter, and we must examine those, and we must find a way to tell better stories in some way. I think that is brilliant and important point to make. And you know, when I gave my list of various kinds of poems that go all the way back, I skipped over one that I usually say, which is I usually include in that list, and alas, war poems. Yeah. Um, you know, during most wars, there are songs or slogans or poems, things which use, poetry is a set of technologies that has its roots in memory and memorability. And I love somebody here tonight used the word portable. And I love the idea of poetry as a portable art because it, you know, a few words can be remembered and carried in your pocket and brought out when you need them most. Um, and often I think that's our only job is, you know, all of us, you know, the 50,000 people in America writing poems, our job is <laughs> amongst us, between us, to come out with a few useful phrases that will be remembered and carried on. But it is very true that it is a neutral technology and not always for the good. Because I have a slightly Pollyanna-ish soul, um, I like to think that at the taproot of poetry's techniques, they do depend, you know, metaphor, the comprehension of image, the comprehension of narrative, they do depend on empathy. They depend on interconnection. They depend on the recognition that when you bring two things together, they touch and affect one another. And I cannot help but have a hope that between these two possibilities of the memorably dangerous and the memorably um, healthful, that the very fact of our understanding being empathic in every realm, um, you know, when you do chemistry, when people do mathematics, we understand these through our bodies, which are human bodies. And if we recognize that they are, then, then perhaps we will, um, recognize the fundamental kinship and also with the animal bodies. Um, that, that life, bio, biological life is kinship. And we treat our kin well if we recognize that that is what we are. The kin, the kin part, the humanity part. So I know before um, we close the evening, we want to make space to have some questions yeah, absolutely. from the audience. Thank you, Chair Jackson. Yes. Um, we're, we're running a little bit low on time, but we do want to hear a, a couple of questions. If there's uh, two questions that we could uh, share, uh, there's a microphone on this side of the aisle and on this side, just for the sake of a recording. If you would go to that microphone, sir, uh, we'll take that and we'll take one more question. If you can just uh, uh, share a thought or an idea or a question for us to discuss for a moment. <coughs> Around the turn of the century, the last century, uh, when Charles Lindbergh flew across the ocean, there are a great vast number of poems were written about that. Uh, but there's very little poetry written about the Apollo program or the moon landing. And I was wondering if that was anything that you uh, guys had any insight on. Thank you. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't really thought about it. <laughs> well, there, there's a poem in the installation about 
the building of the Hubble telescope, but that's not the Apollo moon landing. No. You're, you're quite right. Yeah. There, there's a fair number of poems about stars and, and astro astronomical physics and things like that. But you are, you are really right that I didn't see, when I was hunting for poems, I didn't see one about the moon landing. I bet they were written. No, they, were, they weren't written. <laughs> I don't know. I haven't encountered them either. It's fascinating. <clears throat> Maybe it's our complex current relationship. It used to be the idea of the hero has become so complicated in current life that a poem simply celebrating an enormous heroic achievement of great courage and, and you know, great collaboration. Perhaps lyric poems aren't doing that anymore. Um, I don't know, Any, anybody else got a speculation here? There's, there's a, uh, a little bit of trivia that uh, poetry was an Olympic event until 1948. And that that might have been the kind of poem. It, it was. It was. It was poetry was an, an event in the modern Olympics from 1912 to 1948, and uh, apparently the poems are lost to us. But they were. They would have celebrated grand things like that. And I I, I think in a weird way, uh, there's a connection there that we're we're missing. We don't have that outlet uh, of expression anymore. Everybody is doing. I actually just realized something, which I have a very bad memory, including for my own work. I have a poem in my most recent book that talks about the moon landing. <laughs> <laughs> it was written when the 50th celebration was going on. And, and you know, I have that poem right here in my stack. I didn't even think about it when I heard your question. So I'm your exception, I guess. <laughs> Uh, okay, let's let's take one one more question. Uh, just, uh, yeah. I, I I wanted to first say um, I recently had a death of a parent, and I wanted to thank you for your uh, memory of the role that art and poetry <laughs> and music can play. So I just wanted to thank you on that. Um, and the question I had: the biggest scientific topic in the news today, AI, Chat GPT. <laughs> Um, people are writing poems, technology is writing poems. What role do you think AI has in poetry? <laughs> what was the actual question? I what role does AI uh, have? You know, the chat. Yeah, things. yeah, yeah. Um, Can I leap in on this one? I've been thinking about it so hard, and other people will have other ideas. The thing I have, so first of all, every single article that I read about AI and what it is doing includes the phrase, it writes poetry. <laughs> it can write a sonnet, it can write a haiku. Every, and I think that is fascinating because it shows that even in a world where few people read poetry, the idea <laughs> of poetry has remained so central and important as standing in for something <laughs> that it is in, really, you check out all those essays, you will see every single one, it can write poetry. If you look at the poetry it's writing, it is absolutely ghastly. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. Chatbot 3, I don't know about Chatbot 4, but Chatbot 3 thinks that poetry is rhyming blue with true yep. and being yep. sentimental, mm -hmm. and so far, they're not there yet. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay, somebody else. We'll get there. <laughs> yeah. I played with it too. That's exactly right. It's just miserable. Miserable. <laughs> it's 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 insulting, and and I don't know how else to say it. That said, AI is not going to go away, and it's getting bigger. It's it's incrementally growing. It's just it's just uh, uh, going to be part of our futures. It doesn't scare me, but I don't know what it, where we're where we're going either. But I've been on the brink of that. A number of times, I remember getting a computer for the first time. I, I didn't even know how you turned it on exactly. But uh, being on the brink of something and, and being uncertain about it and, and falling prey to the idea of being scared of it is don't fall into that trap. We've got to make it work for the greater good. So many things uh, have a, 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 a dangerous edge to them, a, a bad edge to them, but 
it seems to me we, we just are facing something we, we don't understand yet, and we shouldn't be scared of that. I'm just hoping that it's in its teething stage, you know, that, um, or that we are with it, and that we will learn, just as you say, mm -hmm. how to use it in a better way. Yes, I've played with it, too, mm -hmm. to see what would happen. And then I asked it to write poems about, say, an eclipse or something, in the style of various people. <laughs> <laughs> um, and of course, in, in my own style, too, to see what would happen. And boy, you don't ever want to do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because it will point out to you, oh my god, did I say that? Why does it keep saying that? <laughs> um, this is exactly what it does. Isn't that it? is what it does. And it did that like caricatures of everyone. Um, in the most ham-fisted, uh, take a hammer and hit wood sort of poetry writing way. Um, so that's where it is now. But that doesn't mean that it isn't going to be useful in some other way. I, maybe I we'll, don't know what. Yeah, maybe we'll have to, I think it'll get better. Uh, not on poetry necessarily, but on other things it'll get much better. And maybe we'll have to redefine intelligence in a certain way so that there are different kinds of intelligence, including that of man and machine combined. Uh, I'm not saying it's any better, but just as we've started, as we've, we've come to think about emotional intelligence and things like that, there, there may be a, a way that the, the, mach, the programs imagine, I don't want to use the word think, because there, there's too much of an anthropomorphism there. There's also a, a problem that we attribute human characteristics to these machines, and we attribute that uh, they, they explain things, or they, they, don't, they don't explain things, They're, but the people who talk about them make what I would call epistemological uh, claims for them, that, they say they understand something. What they really do is they calculate or they produce a text. I think the useful thing is it makes us realize how much of our texts are reproduced by amalgamation of our teachers and others and things we have read. I think it makes me think about that. Yeah, I, I uh, had some... Uh, experience of this, not with poetry, but with painting. I visited a, a computer lab at Cornell not too long ago where um, he, the gentleman was uh, designing uh, computers that could evolve. And um, they could do all kinds of remarkable things, including paint in the style of lots of specific painters or impressionistic, Quanties, whatever. And just to see what would happen, they entered uh, some of these paintings in a Yale um, competition, and it, it won, it was accepted, until they found out it had been done by a computer. And then they said, well, no, we couldn't possibly have that. But I thought that really what was important there was the mirror that was being shown on ourselves um, and how much of what goes on um, inside of us really is, um, as you were saying, part of all of us that we've amalgamated in various ways. What I think is intriguing is the one thing AI doesn't do is forget. <laughs> And as, as humans, that's one of the things that, that helps us evolve our, our art. We, we, we remember, but we forget as well. We need to. And we need to. And, <laughs> and AI is showing us that. Yeah. So, so this one gentleman here who gave up his spot as the last question has been very patiently waiting. I'm wondering if you could give us a very short question uh, that we could respond to very quickly. <clears throat> I guess I'm curious whether poetry if it had a larger role in the people who run the country, like if it had a larger role for them, if that would make a difference. Oh, well, that's a simple yes, no question. <laughs> <laughs> calls, calls for speculation. Um, yes. So, you know, it has had for some, you know, um, 
Obama read poetry quite regularly, and I believe the Clintons did as well. Um, uh, up to you to decide whether <laughs> that's what made the difference or whether the difference is that a human being who cares about the arts and wants the arts in their life as an expansion of the possible might have a different idea of governance than one who does not. Yes. And, and also, there were, we have to remember there was a time uh, before we had such advanced technology when poetry was in just wildly popular. I mean, Byron was a, a talk about influencers and cultural heroes and stuff like that. Uh, everybody at all levels read them. Um, we just happen to have other distractions <laughs> at the moment. Well, I'll, I'll say, not in direct response to your question, but I think part of what we're doing at the Arts Endowment is encouraging this work at the intersection of arts and other fields mm -hmm. with the belief that it, it's a win-win situation, right? That there is opportunity um, for people working in transportation who are working on our built environment to integrate the arts into that and that, that it, it uh, is not only about physical infrastructure but our civic and social infrastructure as well and that there can be contributions that are, at the same time, um, synergistic. I think the, the other part of it is unlocking opportunities for artists and arts organizations, should they wish to, to have other pathways to deliver their gifts, really. Um, it's not a direct answer to your question yeah. about elected officials, but I think that this belief that the arts are most powerful when they don't exist in a silo and when there is opportunity for that weaving in into our daily lived experience and, and into the mechanisms and relationships that we rely on to care for each other. I think that's, that's a good thing. Chair Jackson, I think that's a wonderful note to end this on. Thank you for that. And thank you for the panelists. Okay, now the panelists have promised us one other special treat after the community share. So what the community share is, is we're about to go into a reception. This is your opportunity to take one of the microphones for 30 seconds, introduce yourself, your work, your collaboration, your integrative uh, project between disciplines. Thank you. With the idea that you're gonna get people to come talk to you during the reception. So if you'd line up on either side, you get 30 seconds. So it's like speed dating for creative people. <laughs> so we'll have fun with this. Uh, let's start with you, sir. Hi, thank you all so much. This has been such an extraordinary experience. I'm Walt Hunter. I'm the poetry editor for The Atlantic Magazine. And I'm uh, chair of the English department at Case Western Reserve University, where we have an extraordinary number of English majors who interweave their majors with the sciences, majoring in computer science and English, biology and English. Most of our majors are double and triple majors. But building on that, we've just received a $2 million grant from the Mandel Foundation to support a major in experimental humanities. And so my teaser here is, or my, my um, invitation is, if you have any ideas for what students who are interested in combining English or the humanities and the sciences uh, might be keen on uh, studying or doing uh, in terms of projects, I'd love to talk with you afterwards. And thank you to all our panelists. Wonderful, thank you. Over here, let's uh, use ping pong back and forth. Hello, my name is Matt McEntee. I'm a social practice artist based in Northwest DC. Uh, we operate a project called the Make Fix Anything Project. We will help you make or fix nearly anything for free. It's, uh, and we, we do encourage people to think big. One of our participants is literally sending something to the moon right now. Um, so uh, that's, that's that art thing. And then also working on, within the context of that, backyard carbon sequestration. Um, very excited to be surrounded by so many smart people, and I hope I can learn from you all. Okay, fantastic, thanks. And back over here. My name's Mary Rednofsky. I'm the daughter of a NASA engineer that worked on NASA starting from the very beginning at Langley down to Houston, and uh, including the Apollo 11. And um, I'm writing a book currently about the men, it was all men at the time, that were working in the back rooms 
of uh, NASA that were working on the problem solving of Apollo 13, for example. And um, so I'm, I'm writing it, but from the perspective, from my perspective, from a child who grew up in the uh, space race. And um, so I'm looking for perspectives uh, to show that uh, it's not just the one hero, the man that went to the moon, who is the uh, person to be celebrated, but all of the people behind the scenes as well who participated. So I'm looking forward to publishing that soon. Thank you. Now be sure to take notes as we go through this because this is the person you want to have a glass of wine with afterwards. <laughs> Back over here, Brian, welcome. Welcome, thank you. What a, a brilliant evening. So thank you to the panelists and all of our moderators and facilitators. I'm Ryan McGranigan. I'm a NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory Aerospace Engineer and Heliopacist. Um, one of the things I'm most passionate about though, and it kind of ties in this evening, is creating spaces and forums for interdisciplinary, cross-cultural collaborations and conversations. And that's taken multiple forms, but one of the forms is a collaboration with the CPNAS to do flourishing salons, as we've been calling them. And these are open spaces for people to have discussions and, and most recently have been focusing on uh, one we've been calling the knowledge commons in the future of democracy. And so it kind of tackles some of these issues we've talked about tonight. And then another forum that we explore is a podcast series called Origins, where we look into the pivotal moments across the lives of thought leaders like the people we've heard from tonight. Um, so thank you again. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Ryan. Ryan is actually uh, helping us sort of reimagine and think forward what happens uh, from Dazers moving forward. So, Ryan, thank you for sharing. Over here, sir. I'm wondering if anyone is interested in how poets can help healthcare workers. I work for a small nonprofit called the Good Listening Project. We have a team of specially trained listener poets who have written thousands of poems, custom written for nurses, doctors, and social workers around the country to help support their well-being. And we're trying to raise money to do a longitudinal study to demonstrate our impact on helping to fight burnout. Burnout in healthcare with listening and poetry. If you are a funder or if you know someone who might be interested in funding this, I would love to talk with you. Wow. Thanks. I, I happen to know that uh, the head of integrative medicine at GW was here. He's left. But if you will connect with me afterwards, make sure I have your contact information. Okay. Okay. Over here. Hi. My name is Julia Smith, and um, I work at the Smithsonian Early Enrichment Center, which is a school for children, infants through kindergarten, located in the National Museum of Natural History and the uh, Museum of American History. And I work in our Office of Engagement, where we um, kind of use our museum community and our general community to connect with families and young children. And we're actually collaborating with uh, CPNAS and the Wick Poetry Center to put on a family day in July about the um, Poets for Science exhibit. Um, we are also uh, presenting at the Smithsonian National Education Summit um, all about STEAM education because, of course, young children are very natural scientists. It's how they interact with the world, and they're very natural artists as well. Fantastic. Thank you. In July, July, family day here. Don't necessarily have to be a family with kids, if you know, grab some kids, grab some kids in the neighborhoods <laughs> with their parents' permission, bring them over. Okay, over here. Yeah, yeah, that's it. I'll just hold it like this. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, my name is Lynn Oliva Lilly, and I'm a art photographer from Silver Spring, Maryland. Um, I uh, specialize in the photo book. I, I love them. That's the way I love to present my work. And um, the science and poetry are major inspirations, as well as music. I've published two books, and I'm on my third. That's coming out in September. The first book was called Tender Mint, and the second, uh, Deep Time. Um, so I'm very interested in uh, metaphors from science. So if anyone would like to uh, talk about that, I'd love it. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks. Bill, welcome. Thanks, J.D. Should, should we let Bill yeah, okay, we're, we're gonna, we, we, agree, we agree, you can share. Thank you, JD, thank you, Chair Jackson. <laughs> I'm Bill O'Brien, I'm uh, the Director of Creative Forces, which is an initiative of the National Endowment for the Arts. 
and uh, it's one of the arts, health, and well-being efforts that the agency's involved in. Um, specifically, Creative Forces is a, an initiative of the National Endowment for the Arts in partnership with the Departments of Defense and Veterans Affairs, and the, the uh, overall aim of, of everything around Creative Forces is to advance health and well-being for military-connected populations who've been exposed to trauma. Uh, and we do some of this through embedded creative arts therapists, our lead dance movement therapist is uh, right over there, raise your hand, Liz Freeman. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, it started as an expressive writing program at Walter Reed and expanded to, uh, on the clinical side, uh, to include art therapy, music therapy, and dance movement therapy. We now have uh, creative arts therapists in 12 DOD and VA clinics across the country. And then last year, we uh, created a national grant program. So for this room, uh, I would just kind of point out that around Veterans Day, a little bit before Veterans Day, we'll announce the next round of Creative Force Community Engagement Grants. Uh, any eligible entity, nonprofit, uh, you can find out what's eligible on our uh, website, but um, uh, are eligible to apply uh, to support military and veteran populations and their families and caregivers. Uh, partnerships with VA clinics or vet centers are encouraged. If you're interested in that work, definitely find me and I'll help you find your way to that grant opportunity. And then uh, our director of research and analysis, Sunil, Sunil Iyengar, is uh, sitting next no, hold, to hold on, Liz. That's not fair. They, they have to come stand up. No, that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's helping us organize our next uh, research summit. It kicked off, our first one kicked off here at the National Academies. Uh, about six years ago, and it was to launch a five-year research agenda. We're going to refresh that at the at our partners at the Henry M. Jackson um, Henry M. Jackson Foundation for the Advancement of Military Medicine. A little, uh, a few, about about a week after Veterans Day, um, we think that some of that will be streamable. In either case, uh, Creative Forces NRC .arts .gov is there, there's a subscribe button and we'll tell you when the grant program is coming out, we'll tell you when we're doing seminars. And uh, Sunil and, and Liz and uh, I would be happy to answer more questions. Right. Uh, yeah, the National Endowment for the Arts has just been such a wonderful partner uh, in so many of these wonderful innovative things. So uh, buy, buy Bill a glass of wine and he'll share some more information. <laughs> so let's go, let's go back over here, ma'am. Ma'am, 30 seconds. Just, uh, just wait for okay, let's go over here. Picture. <laughs> okay, can we, let's, let's, while you're taking a picture, we're going to let him, him go first. Okay, go ahead. Hi, go. I'm, I'm Zohar Rome. I'm a writer and director, and I'm, I've been creating a, a, a TV series about Marie Curie and her daughters. And sometimes, as part of the creation, I journal as that character, as that person. But today, it's occurred to me that what I could do is just write poetry as that person and see what happens. So that's, that's the revelation I had today. Good, fantastic. I hope we can uh, connect you with other people. Ma'am, are you ready for a question? Thompson, are you ready? No? Ma'am, would, oh, you, would you Yes, oh, good yourself, evening. Um, my name is uh, uh, Noel She. Uh, I'm a global advocate for peace and the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. I'm the first uh, Chinese American knighted by French President, President Macron as the Chevalier de la Légion d'Honneur. And during the pandemic, I published my first book, my picture book, titled uh, Noel, World Citizen, La Vie en Rose. It has documented my international career from Shanghai to Paris to New York to Africa and back to New York, and has highlighted my career with the United Nations as well as my curatorial work in the art field. It is my uh, honor and privilege to in introduce you to, uh, this book. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much for, for being here. We appreciate it. Let's go over this way. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Derek Allen. I am a cultural artist and music educator. I um, spend my time exercising my practices through after school programming for the youth, as well as cultural exchanges and entertainment. Um, I'm a percussionist myself, so I never am too far away from a drum or any musical instrument, uh, but I get to use that as a key and a tool to open doors for so many other people's lives throughout the local, state, and international community. So I love being around other 
um, like-minded people, a lot of people who are doing amazing things in their craft and field, and I would love to collaborate however we can. Much love. Take care. Fantastic. Thank you. And back over here. Hi. Um, my name is Shahida Osman. I'm a visual artist from Singapore. Um, so right now, I'm having an art exhibition opening coming up on Mother's Day, Sunday, 14th of May. Uh, I'm also actively looking for a venue for my 196 portraits of the missing Uyghur people. It's right now at GWU, but they said they want it out by fall, so I'm actively... Right, so anybody... I also run programming, so during um, the exhibition period, which runs from the 14th until the 31st, uh, there'll be an astronomy day on 20th, where Dr. Bob Kellogg is going to talk about sundials, and Dr. Lee uh, Yo from NASA is going to be talking about the trip to the moon. Um, so I hope I'm going to share. Um, if any of you are interested, I've got um, the program here. Thank you. Fantastic. Always looking for venues and other ideals. Over here. Hey, how y'all doing? Um, my name is Malik Dope. I'm an international percussionist and lyricist from Washington, D.C. Uh, you might have saw me if you watch TV in like 2020. I was on America's Got Talent as a finalist uh, representing Washington, D.C. But I've, uh, I've partnered with different schools uh, and different other organizations all in D.C. representing for youth, whether it's for like philanthropy and just motivation, uh, teaching drums or just teaching music for like getting them prepared to like go towards the industry or anything like that. So, um, yeah, I'm, also, I'm always used for that talent in the city to appeal to the youth and stuff like that. So if we can ever collaborate, um, I think... Uh, the kids need something to, to look up to, so hit me up. <laughs> I, th I think that is incredible work that you're doing. Thank you. And over here. Hi, my name is Jonathan Katz. I'm uh, uh, teaching and doing strategic planning for the arts management program at George Mason University. I want to share what the, what the term project is for the course called Arts and Society. Each class participant has to pick one of the 17 sustainable development goals of the United Nations and then demonstrate how an arts project can advance that goal. They do, they do a paper, they do a slide presentation, they do an annotated bibliography. We think that the advent of, um, of chat PBT, which we've been talking about, um, is going to enable us to take advantage of focusing on what the, what the learners have to do in arts management and cultural policy, which is, which is the value statements and, and, and that, that work, um, and the curatorial philosophy, um, the logic model of how the project can be uh, implemented, and the evaluation of what it is they're going to measure and observe that's going to make a difference in the world. I'm happy to talk about these things. Thank you very much. It sounds very, very interesting. I'll be One fast. More. I won't keep you from your wine. Uh, <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm president of a little organization called the Women's Sacred Music Project. We're building a hymnal by, for, and about women, and so powerful poetry, which helps people to move beyond a white supremacist view of God and society, seems to us a really important goal, and so we're looking for that poetry to change hearts and minds. Wonderful, thank you so much, and thank, oh, That's we've got good. one more over here. Yeah, let's, hi, let's I'm Halia Melnick, here. and David, you might know me, I'm doing the qualitative analysis for the facilitated poetry writing workshop that you did at Ohio State University with Brittany Waterman, and I'm glad to see there's someone else here doing work with burnout and healthcare professionals, so I'd be glad to talk with anyone who has some insights in how that process works and what they might like to see um, about that in a journal. Okay. Wonderful. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> so this is a wonderful audience. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Such, such diversity. Jane, you promised us a little treat. So, so each of us, if you can bear it, promised to read a very, very short poem to close it out. Um, Alberto, would you like to start? Sure. <clears throat> Who's that good-looking pie chart walking down the hall? <laughs> We get lost in the wandering story, small, individual, unbalanced, personal equations that we are. Lost in the graphs, the full-color charts, the electronic bites and latest trends busily narrating us. But what are we? Charts begin with people and end with people, but in between, they're not people. And yet, 
so we explain ourselves, as if our insides were a meat of numbers, holding us up, each a rangy bone construct working within allowable tolerances, our lungs, our livers, our lives, more statistical than actual, we walking around as handsome percentages of ourselves, beautiful portions of our futures. We let numbers enchant us every time. We let them be our best novelists, let x-rays be our best art. But they are us, all of it, the numbers. They are us. And let's just be messy and say it again. They are us. I know, I'm looking, I'm trying to find it. Um, All right, here we go. Ultimate, uh, this is uh, for my goddaughter, Zoe. Ultimate immigrant who passed through the Ellis Island of your mother's hips with a name slit loose from its dialect of cell and bone, welcome to the citadel of our lives. We listened for the hoofbeats, your heart, for nine months, and then your mother nearly died hospitably to give you light. Like a Hawaiian princess, you are carried everywhere on a litter in a carriage by the arabesque of one's arm. Your feet have never touched ground. You who can't even roll over when you want, creamy little tyrant, control the lives of all around you. Sound leaps from your face and your ribs quake each time the downy world chafes. Last week, you first smiled because grown-ups acted silly. Things elude you, but you can grasp absurdity already. By mistake, you suck your wrist instead of mother's nipple, and we laugh. With your operatic cries and Michelin man pudge and seepages from below and eyes alert as twin deer, you have no sense of self whatever. Zoe Klein, goddaughter with a hybrid name, living in the soft new crook of your mother's arm with a face like a Dalai Lama's or a small Neanderthal's. You live a dream by halves now, slumbrous, milky-breathed. In time, love will answer questions you didn't raise. A belled marvel, the cat of your inquiry, will stalk through a world brighter and more plural than you guess, where a baby's fingerprints, loopy weather systems, one for each tip, will leave you spellbound that mere matter could come to this. Uh, I have mine on a computer, so I'll have to (laughs) go over there. Amir, if you could turn that on. Yes. So, um, I don't mean to bring a downer into this, but poetry can uh, deal with other things uh, than the, the problems and the important problems we've heard about. And uh, one of the problems is right now the Russian aggression against Ukraine. So uh, let me read a poem about that. Uh, Petropavlovsk Kamchatsky is a Russian seaport on Kamchatka, on far eastern Kamchatka. It is 7,500 kilometers from there to Mariupol in, in Ukraine. Amid rusting hulls in Petropavlovsk Kamchatsky, a man is sitting in a boat. He says, I've been waiting for you. Let's go. So I get in. Where? He asks. Mariupol. Mariupol, you don't look like a Ukrainian spy. I say nothing. There is an island in the bay far away. Mariupol it is. He rows, strong arms. Deep water hides submarines, he says. And in the rivers near our volcanoes, there are leeches as big as mice. And bears, do you like bears? Yes, but give me the salmon they catch. The island looms in heavy fog. I'll wait for you there. 
I go into the fog which clears to blocks of Soviet-era apartments now shattered, torn up walls, wallpaper flapping in the wind, reinforcement rods bent to V, splinters of people's lives, gaping holes, mattresses spilling their innards, the smell of rotting vegetables, of powder, of shit, and pulverized grit settling on a doll's torso. I go back through the fog onto the jetty. He's there sitting in a boat smoking a cigarette. You have enough, he asks. I shiver. He makes no motion to the oars. Take me back, please, I say, and take out the gold coin. I was there, I say, in Warsaw in 1945. It smelled the same. You're Jewish, yes, please. Go back to 45. Do you remember how could you forget who freed you in trucks with Katyusha, Stalin's rockets? Where would you be? Back, please, he says. My father was there. I was there. And I see the boat is sinking. So I wrote this poem uh, quite a few years ago when I was both personally in need of what it's talking about, but also thinking um, about the biological aspect of what it's talking about, optimism. More and more I have come to admire resilience. Not the simple resistance of a pillow whose foam returns over and over to the same shape, but the sinuous tenacity of a tree. Finding the light newly blocked on one side, it turns in another. A blind intelligence, true, but out of such persistence arose turtles, rivers, mitochondria, figs, all this resinous, unretractable earth. Thank you one more time to all the panelists. And please join us for a reception. Remember who it is that you would like to speak to that you heard uh, during the community share. Um, and there's also enjoyed the exhibit uh, in the uh, court, in the gallery as you walk into the Great Hall to the right. Also right outside of the stairs, there's another exhibit to explore in the upstairs gallery. Thank you.